would not be an exaggeration to say that the game that we played in Baku, our chess club on the boulevard on December 10th, 1977, played a very important role in my whole chess career. This game has all components of my signature style. But I couldn't say no to former world champion, the patriarch of Soviet chess school. You are listening to KasparovChess.com podcast, episode 15. In the fall of 1977, I was very busy working on my chess. Regular sessions with Shakarov, improving my openings, analyzing them deeply. Sessions with Makagonov, working on my positional chess, on middle games positions. Regular communication with Alexander Nikitin, who kept sending fresh information from Moscow, news chess magazines, books, and a collection of uh, studies. I could feel that my chest muscles were growing and I was ready to prove myself and to make a big hit in professional adult tournaments. But I needed some practice beforehand. And uh, in December, I asked uh, my friend and rival, Elmar Magiramov, to play a few training games with me. Elmar was also a student of Alek Primorodsky, but he joined his group later than I did, though uh, he was four years older. He made very quick progress, and uh, he was well known for his uh, opening to search. He was always at the cutting edge of opening theory, and I have to say that he had uh, quite an impact on uh, my opening repertoire at the time. Thanks to him, I uh, look favorably at hedgehog structures that my grandmother likes so much. He, as I already mentioned, uh, convinced me that modern Benoni was a good opening for my style, and though my first experiment with Leonid Zeit was uh, not successful, I played it regularly and uh, had few great wins. One of them that we'll discuss later against Viktor Korchnoi in 1982 at the Chess Olympic in Lucerne. Both my grandma and myself, like Skibeningen, thanks to the influence of Primorodsky, but Elmar was also a big fan of uh, poison pawn variation. And eventually, I also included it in my opening repertoire. Elmar became a grandmaster, and uh, his greatest success was at the very end of uh, the Soviet Union, the last Soviet national championship that was played in 1989 and organized uh, on the Swiss system. He tied for second. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, he decided to move from Baku to the Emirates, and uh, had been staying in Dubai ever since, working on chess, doing probably other things. And I have very dear memories of our work together. And a few times at the visit to Emirates, we always sat together talking about the past, but also about his very original and thoughtful ideas about uh, computer chess. It uh, would not be an exaggeration to say that the game that we played in Baku, in our chess club on the boulevard on December 10th, 1977, played a very important role in my whole chess career. It was a training game, but that game played the role of a sign to tell me that I was ready to move forward and to demonstrate my true strengths to the world of chess. For this game, I selected uh, Queen's Gambit. 
not my favorite opening at the time. And the only reason I chose uh, Macagonov's system was that I had prepared an interesting novelty in a line employed by Elmar. And I knew that Elmar was very consistent with his openings. That's why I could be sure that uh, he would play this line with Queen B3, which was introduced by Lev Pologayevsky. And the whole idea of this plan was to make sure that White could stop the breakthrough C7, C5 by um, X-raying bishop on B7, with queen from B3, and also attacking pawn on D5 after playing rook D1, if the center is open. And uh, if black plays C6 at move 11, then after bishop D3, short castle, Rook e1, white is typically preparing e3, e4, the breaks with the center, and uh, there were few games that white won quite convincingly. My idea, move 11 was the most audacious one, to play c7, c5 anyway. At first sight, it looks suicidal because white position is very solid and they just need the uh, one more move to develop the bishop and then the king can uh, castle and black pieces are not yet well developed organize any any attack but i could feel that there was something in this position and black could sacrifice the material because they could win few tempests queen on b3 could be attacked with white knight pierce on c5 and two tempests to develop a bishop and then castle it's still a lot in the opening if one side plays very aggressively. Elmer, I guess, was shocked when he saw c5, but he didn't um, show any surprise. Uh, he always tried to look calm, and uh, he took on c5, and after knight d7, he started to think. Obviously, after c takes b6, knight c5, black has a compensation. And Elmar knew that I spent time analyzing it. In fact, my idea after Queen C2, the most natural retreat, was to sacrifice another pawn to play D5, D4, opening my uh, bishop B7 as well. And after Knight takes D4, Queen B6, I thought that uh, White still had problems with uh, development because Bishop on F1 cannot leave, pawn on G2 is hanging, and uh, Black could bring both rooks in the center, organizing a very serious pressure. But later, Makagonov demonstrated that uh, this idea was not uh, working. Actually, White could sacrifice this pawn on g2, after bishop e2, bishop takes g2, rook g1, and then uh, after knight f5, after bishop's retreat, White organizes attack of its own. Though much later, when computers were used to analyze the position, it was found out that uh, after uh, queen c2, black could simply take on b6 with a pawn, having uh, decent compensation, and most likely actually recovering uh, material deficit soon. I can add that while idea with immediate c5 didn't uh, have any followers, the concept worked out nicely after 11 rook e8, bishop d3, and now c5. I once even played this position with White against Beliavsky in 1978 in uh, my first uh, Soviet national championship. Uh, I took on c5, and after knight d7, I uh, played uh, c6, bishop takes c6, and then castle, knight c5, queen a3. And here Beliavsky uh, made a bad move d4, and the pawn sacrifice proved to be incorrect. I can also mention my uh, game against Viktor Korchina, game 10 in our semi-final match in London in 1983, when I incorporated Queen's Gambit into my opening repertoire. And uh, Korchina uh, made a quiet move, a3 after uh, a rook a8, preparing for c5 and organizing potential retreat for white queen to a2. So I decided to play positionally, 
and the game ended uh, in a draw of a very lively fight. But let's go back to Baku, December 1977. Elmar decided to decline my gambit, and he chose the most solid way of neutralizing Black Initiative, as he thought, by playing c6, and after I took on c6, he played knight d4. Again, very natural move. Black bishop is attacked, white uh, blocked this isolated pawn, and uh, it seems that um, black could not develop any initiative. But king is still in the center, and bishop was still on f1, and I could immediately feel that there's something there, that I could uh, start an immediate attack by taking on d4. Black gives up its bishop, but it's not uh, important to keep the bishop when we can win Tempest and open the position. The best uh, chance for white was to take on d4 with a pawn to make sure that black knight cannot be activated immediately and black bishop on c6 will be still uh, cut from um, active play. But uh, after queen g5, white has to play g3 and then rook a check, bishop e2, queen h5 or queen g4, and white king is still in the center. And uh, black has very comfortable game, but it was not the end of story and uh, white could hold the position. But rook d4 looked also natural. But then white knight attacks queen, knight c5. Queen goes back on d1. Then Knight goes back, but attacking the rook from e6. Rook goes back, and then, of course, d4. I didn't even calculate this line. I knew it was right just to move forward, just pushing and uh, organizing uh, uh, an attack against the white king that was on e1. Yes, technically, we played uh, queen's gambit, but for me, it was just an opening where I had my chance to go after highest price of the game, my opponent's king. And after ed4, I played rook e8. And here Elmar made a serious mistake. He was uh, visibly disturbed because he didn't expect that so soon he will be under this serious pressure. And uh, his uh, next move, f3, was a decisive mistake. So the best chance was to push the pawn, push the pawn in the center, d5, and after knight f4, check, and play bishop e2, knight takes it to check, king f1, bishop d7. Uh, and taking on g2 now is not possible because of queen g5 check, then bishop h3 check, and queen g2, so and black is, is winning. But uh, move 22, white can play rook g1, um, and uh, after knight f4, there is a computer line, bishop g4, f5, Rook d4, and uh, white is still uh, holding. And the moment Elmar played a free, I knew that I was up to something great. Without much of thought, I took this pawn with my bishop. I knew it was right, even without deep calculation. Now, white has to take with a pawn because after queen takes a free knight g5 check, that was in the queen. GF3, queen h4 check, doesn't happen often in the queen's gambit, just to attack uh, white's king uh, in its original position. Rook f2 only move, knight takes d4 check, bishop e2 only move. Uh, after knight e2, knight f3 mate, so uh, quite a picturesque position. Bishop e2, still knight takes a free check, king f1, queen h3 check, rook g2, knight h4, rook g1, and rook a d8. It was found later that uh, queen a4 was the best uh, defense for white, trying to bring the queen on g4. And of course, black had considerable advantage after simply take on g2, but uh, also Nikita's suggestion knight f5, continuing an attack, is probably stronger. Because after king e1, queen e3, queen c2, and rook e5, black probably still has decisive attack. But understandably, Elmar wanted his queen to be close with the king. 
and played Queen Iwan, trying to keep his pieces together and hoping that it would help him to build defenses around his king. But it didn't work. White pieces crowded around their king, but couldn't offer any help. My next two moves, rook d3, move 26, and especially knight f3 at uh, move 27, I did with a great pleasure. It was quite a position that white, having almost the entire army on board, couldn't do anything and just had to wait for black to eventually break through. Of course, rook on d3 was untouchable because of knight takes h2 mate. And uh, queen g3 also didn't work because of knight d2 check and then winning the queen. Elmar decided to wait, playing rook h1, but after rook d3, the paralysis was absolute. And then after b5, the move that uh, prepared b4 to push knight from c3, white resigned. This game has all component of my signature style. The opening surprise, the pawn sacrifice, trying to get an initiative, and then using uh, opponents in accuracies, storming attack in the center, and eventually against the opponent's king. After this game, I knew that the time has come and I was ready, but I still needed a tournament, an event to demonstrate my abilities. And to begin with, to make a master norm. By the way, the news from European under 20 championships, won by Sergei Dalmatov, made me feel really anxious. I like the news about uh, Yusupov's victory three months earlier. This time I was not depressed. I knew I had to catch up and I knew that I would. And here Botvinnik uh, came to help. He made a call to Minsk, to Belarusian Chess Federation, asking them to invite this kid from Baku to play in Sokolsky Memorial, a local tournament that featured Belarusian uh, top players and a few of uh, local hopefuls who were trying to make a master norm as well. It was quite unusual to bring uh, a young player who was seeking uh, a master norm from outside of uh, the Republic to play in the local event. But I couldn't say no to former world champion, to the patriarch of Soviet chess school. And um, in January 1978, I was off to Minsk with my mother. And I knew it was my chance that I could not, should not miss. <laughs>